which leads us to uh, narration and narration, form. Yeah. So I just want to talk about like uh, the power of storytelling in Shawshank and you know a little bit about form, structure, narration. Um, uh, and I think in the in the film uh, and, and arguably in the in the novella, you know, uh, layers and aspects of storytelling, um, you know, are actually very prominent throughout you know the text. So the concept of storytelling is quite significant and a little bit more complex than what perhaps I originally thought it was. So to, to help me and to help you, I, I create a little diagram, it's a pyramid here, um, and you've got um, these layers of storytelling, uh, you know, that sort of, you know, resonates throughout the, the, uh, the film, let's go film and the, te- and the novella. So uh, I've colour coded it. Uh, so we've got inside the text, so to speak, the, the, the blue boxes and, the, and we've got like Red and Andy's story. So, um, you know, the, the story starts with, with Red narrating the story of Andy. And I found this a bit interesting because I sort of asked myself, why does Red narrate Andy's story? How come, you know, Andy doesn't narrate his own story or how come, you know, there is no omniscient narrator? Uh, and so, you know, having a chat to, to Zoe and, you know, having a bit of a brainstorm, um, came up with a few ideas. Uh, so the first one is is pretty basic, you know, that Red, he narrates the story to demonstrate the intimacy of the friendship between himself and Andy and how show, showing how close they are. Uh, you know, if you can tell someone else a story, you know, you, that, that shows an intimacy. Um, a, sec, a second I, idea that we came up with was this, um, this concept that, you know, Red, he sort of like he sort of pedestals Andy. He sort of like creates a, like uh, sorry, mythologizes him, and and in a way we are positioned to think very positively about Andy almost from the get go. So when Andy Dufresne came to me in 1949 and asked me to smuggle Rita Hayworth into the prison for him, I told him no problem. Andy came to Shawshank Prison in early 1947 for murdering his wife and the fella she was banging. On the outside, he'd been vice president of a large Portland bank. Good work for a man as young as he was. His first night in the joint, Andy Dufresne cost me two packs of cigarettes. He never made a sound. But, you know, we're also grappling with the fact that, you know, this could be a criminal, he could be a murderer. We don't know, you know, early on in the film. I'm Andy Dufresne. Wife-killing banker. Why'd you do it? I didn't, since you ask. <laughs> you gonna fit right in. Everybody in here is innocent. Didn't you know that? Hey, what, what you in here for? Didn't do it. Lawyer fucked me. But um, throughout the throughout the film, through through Red's narration and through Red's storytelling of Andy, he creates a, a hero-like character. Uh, and, and I think this is important for King's purpose um, of story because, you know, it allows us to challenge, uh, you know, preconceptions of criminals, what they look like, what they should be like, how they should act. Whereas, you know, here in, this, in Shawshank, you know, uh, they're, they're humanised and they're, they're, you as, a, as, a, as an audience member actually like them. You know, you, you, know, you, you, vote, you, you vouch for them, you want them to succeed in the end. Oh, I said, essentially, what are we asking for Andy to succeed in escaping prison? You know, and yeah. that's an arguably so, so interesting believe, concept. Do you believe that uh, that Andy is innocent as well? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do yeah. as well. Even yeah. though that it's never really... There's never any physical proof that he is innocent. And we do get that idea from the warden that Tommy was making the story up to please Andy. But then again, I think... I, I just, from the Tommy's death scene, I do get the feeling that he was telling the truth. Yeah. And also, like, I was thinking about if, because I was trying to nut out, what if Andy is guilty? Well, then it sort of defeats the purpose of, like, why would King create a hero out of someone who's genuinely guilty? It just seems a bit... But does it, does it matter, though? I mean, if he was yeah, guilty, oh, does that change anything about the people in that, the prison? That's really interesting because we were discussing that um, yesterday and we were saying that okay so just even if somebody is guilty they still should have basic human rights and they sh- still shouldn't be dehumanised depends what the crime is but or, if he's I don't guilty, know what do you guys think 
then we've just cre- then Stephen King's just created a story that um, humanizes and you know sort of makes a fool of his audience because if he's guilty, then he's a murderer who's escaped from prison, and we've glorified that. Does that? <laughs> oh, have we glorified it though? Because yes, he does have a ideal life where he escapes and he's rich and he's living on a you know in this crystal blue um beach on the in the ocean but then again he faces like two years of sexual abuse and do you know what i mean so he mm-hmm. his life in prison is presented as very horrific i say even if he but the whole time we want to we want him and red to be like to succeed to like escape. they yeah, are yeah. like the their position hero. to yeah well let's life. let's it, let's let's reframe it instead of glorifying the fact that they are prisoners um I th- do you think that's the reason why the the religious layer is placed on top that we create Andy as this almost Jesus figure because he was you know incarcerated he was punished and yet he is considered to be one of the most uh, you know applauded uh, like religious characters yeah. in Christian history um, he I mean he is. He is the reason why Christianity exists. We basically are like, you know, pedestaling a prisoner, a criminal, Mm. technically. And, you know, I use that word loosely. But that's kind of like Andy's story. This Mm. idea of we are told that he's innocent. We are told that he is uh, from the other world, you know, this this other place. And uh, he's here to kind of suffer. And then he escapes and everyone is given hope because well, of that. I guess when he um, exits the sewerage pipe after crawling through all the shit and the rain comes down and it's... I think you can also see the biblical connotations in that because rain often symbolises this, like, baptism and this, like, being, like, absolved of your sins when you're, like, when he emerges from the water and he actually, like, his body language where he puts his hands up in the air and it's like almost like his um it's like a very powerful um symbolic gesture and it's almost like jesus-like in a way um i think that contributes to that idea of him being seen as that jesus figure so i think that in my view if you see it from that theist uh point of view that lens Mm. And you look at through that layer i think that it doesn't matter if he is a criminal i think that you you celebrate humanity not necessarily the crime yeah i can agree yeah. you know with with aspects of that um you know you do want to people make mistakes you know people mm. grow and change and learn and you know it, it's short redemption you can redeem yourself mm. you know and i think that's important i think that's highlighted in that scene where he it's he's confessing his part like his past sins to red and he says i killed her and for a brief moment you think oh he's confessing to the fact that he killed his wife but then he's then andy says oh well i i pulled the trigger because i was a closed i was a closed book and i didn't like care for her enough and i really loved her but i never knew how to show it i killed her red i didn't pull the trigger i drove her away and that's why she died, because of me, the way I am. I don't make you a murderer. Doesn't he sort of say, like, he didn't? He never pulled the trigger, but he did kill her, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. he did suffocate her or whatever. Like, oh, like, yeah, yeah. But, so I, I'm under the impression that he is innocent. Um, and Tommy, the whole Tommy Cross story... Yeah. But then that, that is assuming that the narrator is reliable. Is, is Red a reliable narrator? Mm. Within reason. I feel like when you've got that... It, so the story's told in hindsight. Yeah. yeah. So that's already unreliable. Uh, and it's first-person perspective. And that's, uh, that's going to be relatively unreliable. Um, it's frustrating, I think, because you, you, if you look at it from the just from the story, then it's true. You know, like you take everything from at face value. Mm. Then you look at it from the director's point of view of like, why don't we get everything revealed to us? There is a reason why he withholds, he withholds that information. Mm. And then you go in from the audience point of view of, 
we don't trust prisoners. We don't trust ex-cons. We don't trust people who do crime. And if you're the kind of person that is very, let's say, really religious and all high and mighty, this whole idea of I'm better than you and you are not worth my time, you belong in prison. Of course you did kill that per- your wife. Of course you you know, committed murder because you are in prison and therefore the system found you out and uh, you deserve nothing but punishment. And at that point, do these people deserve redemption? And if we come in at that kind of point of view, we've, we've demonstrated how horrible prison really is. That we now have, from the outside, without even meeting any of these people and even looking at these fake characters, we don't trust them. Because now we're questioning whether or not these fictional characters are actually trustworthy which is a horrible to think way to think about it because then when you have a real person in front of you, then that's the real test. Do you actually trust that this person says that they're innocent or do you trust that this person really has been rehabilitated? It Does Red deserve parole? I think so because when he... I, but that's because you see this... But that's because the film humanises him in such a way where he's quite a likeable character and there's some like little... He makes little funny comments and he does nice things for Andy and um, I also think he he like is a good friend to the prisoners around him and he seems quite wise as to like why people do things the way they do and then I think his monologue in the last um, scene which is quite like confessional in a way where he says you know I wish I could go back and I wish I could tell that boy I want to talk to him. I want to try to talk some sass to him. Tell him the way things are. But I can't. That kid's long gone. and This old man is all that's left. Um, like, he, he kind of refers to himself as a boy that wasn't really... Um, he didn't know much about, the, like, this the implication that he committed the crime when he was very young and the pictures on the um, on the paperwork show him as, like, quite a young boy as well. So yeah. it's kind of like he's been in jail for 40 years. We don't know... But then again, we don't know the crime that he committed. Well, do we? He commits murder, in, but we don't know the, the details novella, about yeah. it. In the novella, it says uh, what the crime is, but... Um he sort of, yeah, there is a moment where it's very fleeting, though, in the film where he says, I, you know, I, uh, with Andy, I did I did same as you. So I think he says, same as you, uh, murder. And um, in the novella, you... you is, this, is this right? Like yeah. You, you, and it's pretty graphic. In and the but novella. you're, you're, into a you're depth. juxtaposed to people who one is guilty and one is innocent. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's what Stephen King really wanted to put down in paper because he, he you know, you, you wanted that conflict, that conflict between mm. us as a reader to go, well, you know, you want to root for both of them. Yeah. I think, like, adding on to what... Like, you asked a question earlier, you said, does, does Red deserve parole, right? Mm. And I think this is an interesting question because I think uh, as the... Coming back to the concept of storytelling and, like, linking to, I guess, the next point that, uh, that I was coming to is... Uh, no, perhaps not until the end. Perhaps, you know, he didn't deserve parole, you know, in the first two times that he was rejected for parole because essentially Red, he need he needed Andy's story. Like, he needs to actually have Andy's, like, story in order for him to learn from Andy and redeem himself and actually learn what, you know, redemption actually is and, and properly rehabilitate and reform in, in the way that, you know, where, he, where he doesn't end up like Brooks. Um, and uh, Yeah, because Red needed hope. So, yeah. Because so the one thing that Brooks didn't have leaving was hope, mm. um, which I'll get to in a little bit. But, um, yeah, like wh- why do you think that um, Red was different to Brooks when he left other than uh, his meeting with Andy? I think, Zoe, you've got some thoughts on this. It seems as though, like, well, the influence of Andy is the difference, I think, because Red and Andy were closer than Brooks and Andy, even though Brooks and Andy work together. What do you think? Yeah, like, I think, you know, um, I think that, yeah, as I said before, Red learns from Andy. He learns, um, you know, whereas people, uh, the uh, throughout the whole text, Andy sort of, 
I guess, pigeonholed into this um, proud, conceited kind of character that's mm. just a bit above everyone. Um, mm. uh, whereas Red knows the truth. He knows Andy's true character, his true story, and that... Um, that changes him, that influences him for the better. And there is a moment where he could, you know, when he's out in the real world, he mm. could go either way, uh, but he chooses to, you know, persevere and, and have that, I guess, uh, embody, embody the characteristics of, of Andy. Yeah. What you were saying about Andy before, how he's a conceited character and that he's a closed book and he doesn't really show a lot of emotion... Um, that comes back to answering the question about why Red narrates Andy's story because Red is a more likable that. character. Oh, that's so, that's so good. Imagine that's good if Andy idea. narrated his own story, then it would be boring. They, yeah, they've, they've characterized <laughs> him in a way, and that, then I went to jail. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that he's just quite like he doesn't even speak for the whole first month of jail, and he's quite and he doesn't. And Red says he doesn't mm. cry or anything on the first, like the first night. He's not the one that breaks down. It's the other. Guy. Yeah, do you think that they do that because they want to paint Andy as some kind of every person? Stoic this, the, man. The, the stoic man or the, the idea that, you know, because he's kind of like a blank canvas, he doesn't really, like, I mean, like you said, he could be a boring character. Um, we imbue ourselves mm. into him because, one, yeah, he's the only innocent person, right? Yeah, because I don't see Andy as having as much depth of character as Red. Mm. Don't you think? And so, we, don't yeah, we have to imbue ourselves into Andy a little bit. Yeah. So, like, we only take what Red says, you know, like, he's stoic, he's strong, he fights off the sisters. He, um, I mean, he almost, uh, he's almost like the, the embodiment of, like, the, the stoic male character, which is not healthy because, you know, guys have to talk about their emotions too, but... He uses that as, as a form of uh, defense mm -hmm. to not be ridiculed. Or do you think that's also because he's like, he doesn't care because he is holding on to hope that he is planning to escape or that he's on his way to? Escape? Maybe, yeah, maybe he's able to endure more because he has that plan for the outside. And so maybe that comes out. Mm. That's why his character is like. That. Yeah, like it's it's yeah. it's in a way like the way I imagine is he's, he's sort of protecting the hope that he has within, and that like you know that what he what you were saying earlier Zoe mm. about you know he's got the music that's in his um, head and his heart oh, like yeah. you know he's it's like he uses he, um, I I mean he could just genuinely be like kind of aloof or whatever, but mm. um, it seems like he doesn't want to. It um, seems like a directo allow, directorial allow, choice. Yeah, yeah, allow for that that you know hope to be damaged and that you know um mm. integrity i suppose mm. it, to quote invictus again it's uh my head is bowed but not broken mm. you know mm. so Very yeah nice. because Very the nice. the whole speech that he gives to red is just after he's come out of two months of being in the hole and even though like, physically he looks disheveled and he's like looking down and he's like sitting on the ground against the wall mm -hmm. i think it's really interesting the set design and I don't know whether this was done on purpose, but in that scene, there's a lot of... They've positioned him behind a lot of green moss and, like, these green plants, and it's kind of like um, life can grow from very hostile environments. And so ex externally, he's quite, like, hard and cold um, at times, but, like, internally, there's, like, a real, like, life force, like, drive to live a different life mm. inside of him that's, like trying to make its way out and and it sort of does appear in that scene that he has with red because he he is very self-aware of what he did in the past and why his marriage failed and he um acknowledges what he did in the past and yeah. acknowledges the mistakes he made mm. and that's the symbol of growth so we've got that foliage that like moss in the background it's like symbol of of his character isn't there like growing. a yeah moment in the film where red maybe in the narration or somewhere where he says um basically like it, it's easy to misinterpret uh andy and his and his coldness um but because he knows him he knows that there's a there's a depth oh yeah that's it, when yeah. they first meet he says I can. Uh, he's talking about how he can understand the people other people mm -hmm. see him as a snob or but he grew a liking to him, mm. yeah. I could see why some of the boys took him for snobby. 
He had a quiet way about him. A walk and a talk that just wasn't normal around here. He strolled like a man in a park without a care or a worry in the world. Like he had on an invisible coat that would shield him from this place. Yeah, I think it would be fair to say I liked Andy from the start. I think as well, like something else that um, to, to sort of, uh, you know, uh, echo on about Red and his narration is, you know, what it sort of does is it, it allows us to, to see the audience, to see the um, story within a story technique. Uh, so we've got Red's story. So I've got a little, another little diagram here. We've got like Red's story, who, which we think is the initial main story. Like we're initially positioned to think this is going to be about Red, but he's actually telling the story of Andy. So that adds another layer. So when Andy Dufresne came to me in 1949 and asked me to smuggle Rita Hayworth into the prison for him, I told him, no problem. And Andy's story, is it actually Andy's story or, you know, are there wider, um, is it a wider story about, you know, hope, perseverance, redemption, etc.? You know, and we're talking about now universal, uh, you know, another layer of universal you know, um, a story about our humanity, a story about, you know, what it means to be human, what it means to be an individual. Um, you know, that's, uh, I think that's, uh, yeah, prominent within, within, the, within the film. Here's where it makes the most sense. You need it so you don't forget. Forget? Yeah, for, forget that there are places in the world that aren't made out of stone, that there's a... There's something inside that they can't get to, that they, they can't touch. It's yours. What are you talking about? Hope. I guess like it sort of in some ways parallels like the novella where it's like in a, in a way it's sort of uh, metafictive. So we've got Red who, and he's, he's actually writing his story in... Um, you know, sort of, I guess, in hindsight. And then, have I got this right, Leo, where then he comes back to it when he's um, gotten parole and he, he adds another, like, chapter mm. or whatever. Uh, and that, so that story, like, it's interesting because you got, like, metafiction where it's a story, like, the, Sh- the Shawshank Redemption, like, novella is a story, and but it's a story within a story, kind of, again, um, layering the aspects of storytelling. Um, and I guess... Like, essentially what this does is it, it sort of serves to um, show the universality of, you know, this isn't just a, a you know, a prison genre film. This isn't just a story about a criminal. You know, this is, these are stories. There are multiple stories. There are multiple perspectives. There are, you know, and they actually do resonate with us. And that's why the story humanises uh, Andy and Red and, and, you know, the prisoners because they we can see it in some ways our own stories within them you know mm. there are aspects of them that that resonate with us yeah. yeah just to add to that the reason why they have the four different perspectives brooks red andy tommy i think you know you've got tommy who's young brooks who's old andy who's rich um red who's african-american and we've got these four different experiences and they all um but they all like share the common experience mm-hmm. of being incarcerated and and um, facing discrimination mm-hmm. and facing dehumanization. Is, yeah. Do you think it's an attempt to kind of convey universality when it comes to prison dehumanization? Yeah, because it doesn't matter what like race, age, gender you are. Mm. Um, it's like the the guards versus the prisoners. It's like us against them, sort of. Um, yeah, because it doesn't matter whether you're in a, a women's system or a men's system, you'll face sexual assault in prison. Like, not everybody, I guess, but, like, it seems as though from what we've been reading um, about situations in prisons where, um, I don't know, it just seems like there's a lot of sexual misconduct that happens in the prison system. Yeah. Like, yeah. take, for example, we were looking at the Orlando's women, uh, Orlando women's prison where they had to like barter for toilet paper and like you know it it doesn't matter with your female or male you just still even though female experience isn't explored in the film but I think 
mm-hmm. like they they are different classes and they do have different education levels and like background and and yet they're still all um you know they still all face this really like horrific reality yeah and to touch on the the whole idea of like uh, sexual assault in prisons um is it is it me or is almost every prison flick comedy or serious they seem to always make fun of men's sexual assault in prison as if like it's a it's a joke it's a dot point in yeah. a, a punchline we're actually talking about this the other day because pop culture detective um did a video youtube video on like how people make fun of um male to male sexual assault and like why is that do you know what i mean like, yeah and the shawshank redemption just like graphically um within our heads i mean not necessarily showing it graphically but it it's it's graphic in its portrayal of yeah andy is regularly assaulted and it doesn't really like pl- place any judgment on it it's just like this no is what it's happens. just pres- there's just that montage that we get of him of yeah. continually being assaulted and there's no punishment really from the secure the guards the only reason why the guards end up um, bashing up Boggs is because they Boggs got rid of like Boggs made Andy go to the infirma, infirma, infirmary infirmary yeah, yeah infirmary and that took away their accountant for a month so it was it was um, self serving Boggs punishment to the guards like say they hadn't bashed Andy to a pulp Boggs probably just would have continued on doing what he was doing I think um yeah it's like their method like because the guards have so much control over them as well it's like their method of again there's like a power system within there's like a power hierarchy within the prison system it's so weird that you know 25 years ago Mm -hmm. it like it took a film like Shawshank Redemption to take male sexual assault seriously seriously but yet today we still question whether a woman is sexually assaulted at all um and that slightly bothers me from like a uh, like from a masculine point of view in the world that the idea that we can make jokes about male sexual assault but you can't make jokes about women's se- sexual assault and then you flip that in reality and men's sexual assault is at at some level in a film at least is taken seriously and uh, in reality we we have to have hashtag me too and even that that's derided amongst the uh the weirdo incels of the world, I guess you could say, um, because toxic masculinity doesn't want to admit that you know there is anything wrong with the sado machoism that we have in our society. So, just a strange aside, but I thought I'd just throw that in. Yeah. <laughs>